Hello and welcome to Mount Tabor. My name is Gray Handwork. I'm the coordinator of guest and new member ministries and my family and I have been attending Mount Tabor for over six years because we believe in Mount Tabor's mission to gather joyfully, to grow spiritually, and to go faithfully into the world to make disciples of Christ. If this is your first time with us today or if you're new to Mount Tabor, we are so glad you're here and we consider your presence to be a gift to us. We'd like to pay that gift forward by making a donation in your honor to the Mask the City Project. Would you please let us know you're here by getting out your phone and texting the word HELLO to the number 336-777-7990. You'll see that number and information on your screen. We look forward to opening up a line of communication with you and getting to know one another. We're glad that you're here and we want you to be part of our mission to gather, grow, and go. Now, whether you've been at Mount Tabor for a minute or for a lifetime, we want to connect with you, especially during this time. We hope you'll stop by our website. This is a congregation that believes in the power of prayer, and we would love to pray with you and for you. So check out our prayer request button where you can leave us your prayer requests. You can also find on our website our bulletin, our events calendar, and lots of information about things that continue to happen uh, here at Mount Tabor during this time. We'd love for you to get connected with our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our adult small groups, lots of things that are still happening. You can also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We look forward to connecting with you and staying connected during this time. So now let's turn our eyes and our hearts to the one who has called us together today. Let's worship together. Good morning, Higher Ground. My name is Marcy Davis, and I'm the Director of Children and Family Ministries here at Mount Tabor. Myself, along with the rest of the Family Ministries team, wants to join in prayer with you today um, in remembering and blessing our students and teachers and administrators as schools start tomorrow here in our county. Please join us in this time of prayer. Heavenly God, we come to you this school year with confusion, heavy hearts, frustration, and sadness. It isn't what any of us expected nor wanted, but we know that in you, we have hope. And we know that you can turn our sorrows into joy. So with that in mind, we bring to you our concerns, our needs, and our petitions, knowing that you will hear us and respond. We lift to, to you, God, all the children who will be going to school online or who will be homeschooled. We pray they feel loved and connected. We pray for children who are going to school for the very first time. Help them to be brave, be good listeners, and help them learn a lot. We pray for motivation so that they are able to learn the material presented to them, and that we ask for your blessing upon them while they struggle with limited social interaction opportunities. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all the children who will be learning in person. We pray you watch over them and we ask that you help them be responsible, good listeners, and good learners. We know we are asking things of our children that we have never asked before. Help them be flexible and to adapt. Hear our prayer. We also pray for those children who will be learning in yet a different way, online and in person. This new way of learning we know will be confusing and difficult at first. Help these children have patience and help them have compassion for themselves, their classmates, and their teachers. Hear our prayer. Counselor God, we want to name our children and youth who have specific needs, physically, mentally, socially, or emotionally. This pandemic has been especially hard on them and their families. Every child is different, but you know their needs and what is best for them. Help these families make the right decisions for their child and help th these children overcome the hurdles that have been placed in front of them. God, with your help, these children and families can excel. Hear our prayer. God, please be with the parents at this time as they struggle to not only be parents, but also teachers and counselors. 
We see them juggling multiple responsibilities, including their children, their marriages, and their jobs. We see them deliberating and weighing all the options for their children and families. They're having to make decisions they never thought they'd have to make. God, please give them guidance in their decision making and peace of mind. Hear our prayer. God, we also want to lift up our college students, these young adults that are ready to leave the nest, to be on their own and to be independent. This isn't what they wanted, what they were expecting or what they need. Please guide them through this transition, whether it be online, at home, on campus, or something in between. Give them strength, give them an open mind so they can learn and give them peace in whatever situation they find themselves in. Help this obstacle strengthen them and not overwhelm them. Hear our prayer. Bless the God, we want to pray for our teachers and administrators. Our teachers who have been overwhelmed and our administrators that are struggling with tough decisions. This is unfamiliar territory for them and they are being asked to do things they are not trained to do or prepared for and are not equipped to handle. But with your help, they will. We know they will well, because of their love and dedication for our children and youth. God, grant them the wisdom. We also pray for patience, patience with the children, parents, and their coworkers. We ask that you give them peace of mind, and we pray that when school starts and the chaos ensues, that they will be the voice of calm and reassurance that our children desperately need. Hear our prayer. Thank you, God. These are our prayers and what is on our hearts and minds. We pray that your loving arms are wrapped around everyone this school year, helping them feel loved and safe. Hear the names lifted up to you out loud and those in silence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Harvey. I'm the Higher Ground Coordinator. Thank you so much for joining us online today. We appreciate your presence. Before we go to prayer, I'd like to share a few opportunities with you. This Sunday, August 16th from 4 to 4.45 p.m. in our church parking lot, we'll be offering a drive-through back-to-school blessing for preschool through high school students. Now, due to the pandemic, we won't be able to collect school supplies for Stuff the Bus like we normally do. However, you can still help with this effort by making a monetary donation through September 15th. This will benefit North Hills Elementary and also stock the pantry for Food for Thought. You can contribute to this through our church website, app, or you can mail to the church office, noting your designation on your check. High School Hotspot is a brand new ministry at the church that offers a place for high school students to gather to do virtual learning with free Wi-Fi and snacks provided. Now this is an opportunity to serve by signing up to be a volunteer or provide a snack. You can go to our website to sign up for this. Also, students who would like to participate in this ministry can go to our website and sign up as well. Your concerns, as always, are our concerns. So please continue to feel free to share any prayer requests you have via our church website. Our pastors, our staff, and our prayer chains faithfully pray for each one every week. You can also join Facebook Live Prayer Time on our Mount Tabor United Methodist Church page on Tuesdays at 8 a.m. with Pastor Mark and on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. with Pastor Bob. Thank you for your continued support of the ministries of our church. You can contribute your tithes and offerings through our website, through the Church Life app, or you can mail those to the church office. Thank you for your generous support. 
We're talking about spiritual fervor today, not losing our zeal for the Christian life, keeping our faith alive and vibrant. Now that can be a challenge right now with everything that's going on around us in the world. These are difficult times and the temptation to become complacent or apathetic is certainly there. But the world needs to see our faith, our persistent hope in the Lord, the Lord who parted the sea, who moved mountains, who walked on water, who reaches out his hand and says, follow me. We are a church who prays, and now more than ever, we need a consistent, pour out your heart to God prayer life. Now in a minute, you're gonna hear a song called When We Pray with these words, all the world starts changing when the church starts praying. Hope is on the horizon, a generation stepping out in faith. So let's step out in faith and pray together. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, you love all people. You love us unconditionally. Lord, we pray and ask, don't let us lose our spiritual fervor, our zeal for you, our hope and faith in you. Help us to draw closer to you, to lean into your every promise, knowing you will never leave or forsake us. We are not alone. You are with us. Help us to stay in your word, to pray expectantly and faithfully, trusting in you and in your provision. We pray for those who are sick, for those who are carrying burdens that are too much to bear, for those who are grieving, for those who struggle with depression and addiction, with apathy. For those who may be feeling overwhelmed or hopeless, may they all be comforted and feel your loving presence in their lives. And help us to be your hands and feet, to reach out to those in need of help. Let us be mindful of those who feel they have no voice. Help us to listen and forgive us, please, when we don't. We pray for healing in our land, and for reconciliation. Thank you for the gift of and the blessings in each and every day. May we be faithful, for it's in your almighty name we pray. Amen. People broken, beaten down and feeling hopeless. Wonder if it's gonna always be this way. Who will speak up for the captive? Show some love and heal a past that finds the wounds we think will never go away. But what if we could be a people on our knees as one before the king? Cause we believe. All the world starts changing when the church starts praying. Strongholds start to break. Oh, when we pray, prison walls start shaking at the sound of praising. Nothing stays the same. Oh, when we pray. Oh. I see hope on the horizon As a generation stepping out in faith Because we will be a people on our knees As one before the King Cause 
we believe All the world starts changing When the church starts praying Strongholds start to break Oh, when we pray Prison walls start shaking At the sound of praising Nothing stays the same Oh, when we pray Oh, when we pray Oh, let your kingdom come, Lord Let your will be done All the world starts changing When the church starts praying Strongholds start to break Oh, when we pray all the world starts changing when the church starts praying. Strongholds start to break. Oh, when we pray, prison walls start shaking at the sound of praising. Nothing stays the same. Oh, when we pray. Oh. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word and for the message you have given Pastor Bob. May he deliver it with power and may we open the eyes of our hearts and minds to its message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Into the great wide open, into the sky so blue, into the great wide open, a rebel without a clue. Greetings, my brothers and sisters, grace and peace to you. My name is Pastor Bob, and I get to be, I get to be, I get to be one of the pastors here at Mount Tabor United Methodist Church. Thanks, as always, for the blessing of worshiping our Lord alongside you. I hope it's a blessing for you, too. And that's just it. Is it a blessing? Mahatma Gandhi said that when I admire the wonders of a sunset or the beauty of the moon, my soul expands in the worship of the Creator. G.K. Chesterton said that when we really worship anything, we love not only its clearness, but its obscurity. We exult in its very invisibility. Are we exulting in even the invisibility? Are our souls expanding? Last Wednesday, we moved the Ignite service outdoors so we could gather once more and worship. But I wonder if we exulted and expanded or were, or were we just glad to get out of the house? Was it worship? What about right now? Are we ready to worship? Or are we just going through the motions, just doing that which we have always done? because that's what we've always done. I want you to know something right here and right now. If your answer is yes, hooray. But if your answer is I'm not sure, cool. If your answer is no, that's cool too. What I appreciate in any of the answers is the candor in which they are given for in that candor, we are all okay to admit that sometimes it just ain't happening. The bus has left the station. My get up and go has gotten up and left. Turn out the lights. The party's over. Sometimes an area of our lives, and particularly our Christian lives, can cool off. Maybe our generosity has grown cold or our passion to serve has gone away. Maybe we've become cynical and lost the selfless love and concern for others. When we were members of Main Street United Methodist Church in Reedsville, Susan and I, or Susan attended a women's Bible study led by Beth Moore, a greatly popular leader of a great many studies who's been doing so for as long as I can remember. I happened to be at the church for another matter when Susan was engaged in her gathering one evening and I peeked my head in the classroom to say hello. 
and was afforded the chance to actually see what all the fuss was about, to see Beth for the first time. What I noticed was not her Texas drawl, though it was charming. What I noticed was not her hair, though it was about as tall as I am. What I noticed was her eyes, for they seemed, at least in the brief clip that I viewed, to never blink. A few years later, I saw Beth in person at one of her live events, and since I was sitting close and was also one of about, well, 12 guys in an arena of about 15,000 women, at one point, she looked right at me, and her eyes once more, once more never seemed to blink. Now, it wasn't one of those creepy Hannibal Lecter, hello, Clarice moments. Beth looked wide-eyed and blinkless because it was as if she did not w wish to miss anything. She wanted to take everything in, the people she was with and the word they were all engaging. She wanted to take everything in. She didn't want to miss a thing. I want to have a faith that is alive and vibrant and expectant. I want to have a contagious, and in this case I'm okay saying contagious, spiritual fervor that also lifts the faith of others. I want to have a passionate prayer life that fuels my spiritual fervor and also influences others. He has been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism is what we read in Acts 18.25. Spiritual fervor comes from sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning his ways. The Holy Spirit will instruct and convey God's love to us. As we engage with our Lord through the Holy Scriptures and through prayer, the Spirit will ignite our hearts with God's truth. And as Paul wrote in his second letter to the church at Corinth, verses 15 and 16 of the second chapter, our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are life-giving perfume. While we're on the subject of scripture, the verse on which we're focusing specifically today comes from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, verses 11 and 12 of the 12th chapter. Hear these words from the New Living Translation. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient and in trouble and keep on praying. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. According to Tim Mackey of the Bible Project, the Book of Romans is Paul's longest and most significant volume penned by the apostle formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, a Jewish rabbi who was part of a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees. He was a passionate defender of the Torah and Israel's traditions. He was a virulent antagonist of the followers of Jesus, whom he saw as a threat to order. But then he had a run-in with the risen Jesus who introduces him to his new job description. This old rabid persecutor of Christians will become their most prolific and potent teacher, leader, voice, and conscience. With this charge, Paul, having been knocked off his high horse by Jesus, gets back in the saddle for Jesus, traveling all around the Roman Empire, telling all he encounters about the Lord he had encountered, forming these new followers into communities of churches to whom he would often write letters, words of affirmation and admonition, words of cajoling and conviction, words of sympathy and censure, all depending on the circumstance. The book of Romans was actually written pretty late in Paul's life to a community long established and comprised of Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus. An emperor named Claudius boots out all the Jews, but five years later they return to a church that is fractured along any number of lines. So Paul writes this letter mostly to get them to get along. He thought the church at Rome could be the assembly that would give rise to churches all the way to Spain. In the introduction to the book of Romans in his Bible translation known as The Message, 
Eugene Peterson calls Paul's words exuberant and passionate thinking. This is the glorious life of the mind enlisted in the service of God. Paul takes the well-witnessed and devoutly believed facts of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth and thinks through its implications. How does it happen that in the death and resurrection of Jesus, world history took on a new direction, and at the same moment the life of every man, woman, and child on the planet was eternally affected? What is God up to? What does it mean that Jesus saves? What's behind all this, and where is it going? These are the questions that drive Paul's thinking. He takes logic, poetry, and imagination, scripture and prayer, creation and history and experience, and weaves them into this letter that has become the premier document of Christian theology. End of quote. Okay, but that's the big picture matter, and that's all well and good, but what about right here and right now, rubber meets the road stuff? Up to chapter 12, Paul has talked about beliefs, the sinfulness of mankind, the forgiveness of that sinfulness through Christ Jesus, the freedom from sin's talons, and then a chronicling of Israel's past, present, and future. That's been the tenor of chapters 1 through 11, and 12 through 16 will speak of how to behave. It's about his will and not mine. It's about his thinking and not mine. It's about his life and not mine. I part, I'm part of a body of believers belonging one to the other, serving one another by employing the gifts given me but intended for others. I'm to devote myself to the other, and the only difference between us comes from the look of my eye, not the Father's. In the Father's eyes, we are all one, and we're all his kids. I'm, I'm getting pumped up here. And that's the really cool thing. Paul wrote this letter 2,000 years ago, and I think he could sense the zeal that would be his readers, including me. So he tells the church at Rome and the church on Robin Hood to hold on to that zeal, hold on to that passion, hold on to that fervor. Keep your eyes wide open. There's so much to see here. You're not even going to want to blink. But what about Christian lives that have cooled off and generosity that has grown cold and passion to serve that has gone away? What about becoming cynical and losing a selfless love and concern for others? Seems to me Paul hasn't seen the news lately. Of the many acronyms employed in the pursuit of recovery, one is known as H-A-L-T or HALT. And the letters denote the dangers to one's sobriety if one gets too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. I think we are in a world of halt. We're hungry for relief, angry at our circumstance, lonely in our distance, social or otherwise, and tired of not knowing when this will all end. But we need not be hungry if we've the bread of life. We need not be angry if we've his joy. We need not be lonely if he is with us forever, even to the ends of the age, and we need not be tired if his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We need not be. A few years ago, Sting was feted at the Kennedy Center Honors, and one of the performers to pay tribute was, and I know you'll be astonished that I am citing him, was Bruce Springsteen. The boss came out and did a song of Sting's called I Hung My Head, and not surprisingly, the boss brought it. I mean, he brought it. At performance's end, the camera panned to Sting, and he stood and applauded raucously, stomping his feet and shaking his fists in fervor. But what really got me was the reaction of Sting's wife sitting directly behind him. You see her wide-eyed and overwhelmed, and all she can utter is, wow. Wow, I'm pretty sure she never blinked. That's the fervor to which call, Paul called the church at Rome, the fervor to which he calls the church on Robin Hood. That's the passion to which we are called in recognition of and devotion to the one whose story of life, death, and resurrection propelled world history into a new direction. And at the same moment, eternally affected the life of every man, woman, and child on the planet. 
It's a world that's hungry, angry, lonely, and tired with eyes that are sullen and weary. But we get to meet that gaze with wide-eyed wonder, zeal, and fervor, eyes of devotion, understanding, compassion, and love, the eyes that are the windows into the heart and soul of Jesus, eyes that never blink because they are the eyes that don't want to miss a thing. We get to. Are we ready? What are we going to do about it? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for eyes that are wide open. Thank you for eyes that don't want to miss anything. Forgive us the times when we allow our hunger, our anger, our loneliness, our weariness to get in the way of keeping our eyes wide open. We want to see everything. We don't understand everything. Sometimes we haven't a clue, but we want to keep our eyes wide open our eyes wide open on you, knowing that your eyes are wide open on us. I pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. You are not alone If you are lonely When you're feeling frail You're not the only We are all the same In need of mercy To be forgiven and be free It's all you gotta lean on But thank God's all you need And all the people said amen Whoa the Lord for his love never ends and all the people said amen if you're rich or poor well it don't matter we go strong we know love's what we're after we're all broken but we're all in it together God knows we stumble and fall So loved the world, he sent his son to save us all. And all the people said, Amen. Whoa, and all the people said, Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love never ends. And all the people said, said amen whoa and all the people said amen give thanks to the lord for his love never ends and all the people said amen Dear God, school is different now. I don't understand the world, but I know that when hard things happen, I should pray. So that's what I do. I pray that we can keep learning, whatever that looks like, and that we'll be together, even if it's in a whole new way. God, I pray as we step into the unknown future that you continue to show me things about myself and life, things I can't learn in books. Be with me, God, no matter how this year unfolds. Help us, God, to do our best every day. Even when every day isn't what we thought it would be. Keep us safe and keep us learning, one day at a time. Thank you, God. 
Amen. Amen. Amen.